I want to go back just to the reconversion just for a second. So <clears throat> you've probably heard on Mormon stories a thousand times kind of the list of the main doctrinal components that I kind of consider to be legit Mormonism versus illegitimate Mormonism. It's kind of like anthropomorphic God, you know, literal Jesus who resurrected, right? It's it's Joseph Smith saw God in Jesus. It's the church received priesthood keys, one true church, and then it's historical Book of Mormon, you know, you're saying this scriptures. is legit Mormon. You're you, meaning what we were grown, me, we were raised no, to. If you've listened believe. to a thousand hours of Mormon stories, you've heard yeah. me ask every guest I've ever had their views on those things. So you've mm -hmm. already said it w when you reconverted, when you went back, it wasn't important to you uh, whether or not the Book of Mormon was historical, and uh, and that's not part of the baptismal interview. Mm -hmm. So I can see how that's not a problem. Yeah. And I'm just saying there's probably six or seven other major elements to an Orthodox traditional Mormon testimony. Yeah. Anthropomorphic the testimony God, glove. Literal Jesus, resurrection, <laughs> priesthood keys, one true yeah. church, right? Uh, um, one true church is said, but I don't see that as one of the, it's culture, not cultural, it's scriptural. I'm uh, saying what we all absorb. I know Mormons. what you're talking about. I mean, it's kind of the core tenets of Mormonism. Yep. So like, it, did any of those did any of those get reestablished or or would you sort of whatever you said about the book of mormon like i don't care i just feel called to do this by god did any of the other core mormon tenets get resurrected or do you have that same position about anthropomorphic god resurrected jesus one true church priesthood keys temple work like mm -hmm. are are all those in that same category of like who knows if they're really true or not I'm I'm just following this feeling and this spiritual voice that I that I hear inside, and the truthfulness of any of those major truth claims is just not important to me anymore. Do you understand my question? Yeah. <coughs> or did some of those get resurrected? It's like, oh, now I believe in the anthropomorphic for God again, or oh, now I believe that Jesus literally died and resurrected again, or oh. Well, now, you know, the Bible is yeah. totally the Word of God and just the Book of Mormon's sketchy, you know, or whatever. Let me try to talk. I'll bring up one, and you can bring them up one at a time if you want, but one that comes first to mind. Um, for probably three years before I left the church, I hated General Conference. And growing up, I loved General Conference. I was the guy with the full legal pad, completely... <laughs> full of notes from the conference talks, each conference, and then studying them in the morning with my scriptures and prayer and ready with all these comments about them in classes on Sundays. I loved general conference until I hated it. Mm -hmm. And I was a little concerned about, you know, how would I feel about general conference? Uh, there <coughs> are some of the leaders of the church that have been the spokespeople for certain on certain issues, and specifically in this community, it's President Oaks with LGBT. He's kind of seen as the Grim Reaper. Um, <laughs> always coming down with a hammer, um, and opening wounds by restating that he has. A reputation. It, it's been his topic for years. And I thought, what do I think about President Dallin H. Oaks? Do I have to agree with him? Um, and in the past, it's been Boyd K. Packer. And there are other more conservative ones. Um, uh, Elder the younger one who was the president of BYU-Idaho. Uh, Iring. No. Uh, Bednar. Bednar. He tends to be more conservative, more kind of black and white in the way he speaks. And as a non-member, uh, these leaders really turned me off. And I thought, how, <laughs> how do I face them? And... So I sat down and watched General Conference. I uh, had this experience in early March. General Conference was April. And 
expecting to, I, I didn't know what to expect. And I watched all the sessions and I absolutely loved it. Even, this is one of those hard topics because when you're in the church and um, I really do want to be respectful, not out of fear that somebody's going to come punish me or boot me out. Um, we put our leaders on a pedestal. In a big way that makes it hard to say anything, but that they're glorious and wonderful and awesome. I don't feel that way. I feel like they're men who deserve my respect. Every time I've been asked to raise my hand and sustain them, I've done it. Not because I agree with everything they say, but overall, I feel like they're trying to do good things. An average member in the church might have this image of, of our leaders sitting in the temple and Jesus stopping in and, and giving them the latest. I don't see it that way at all. And I don't think if you sat down and talked with any one of them, that they would try to say it. I know often in podcasts, it's alluded to the idea that, that leaders let members go on assuming certain things, like that they talk directly with God. <clears throat> Do I talk with God? Did I talk with God on March 5th? I think I did, in a way. Um... I believe in Revelation, and I believe Revelation is mixed up in culture, and I'm going to give an answer a lot of people have heard. Uh, it's not going to feel satisfying to some, but in the context of what I feel about God and what I feel God wants me to do, I feel inclined to give these men loyalty, not in the sense that everything they say is like it's coming out of the mouth of God because <laughs> look at the 1949 First Presidency's declaration. I don't think that came out of the mouth of God. What was the name of that USU professor that in the 40s that you did a, a thing on with the USU papers? and uh, Leonard Arrington. No, he was the guy who was... It was a discussion about blacks and the priesthood and the first presidency was yeah, I know corresponding. I don't remember the name. But. Lowell, I can't remember his name. But if somebody looked at that correspondence from between the first presidency and that man today, it would be a little off-putting. And nobody would call it revelatory or true. Um, President Oaks recently said... And I think in that conference that they had celebrating the 40-year thing since the Revelation, he said before the Revelation, he didn't have a testimony that blacks should not have the priesthood. And I guess that's kind of how I feel about a lot of things. I don't have a testimony of it, but these are this is my tribe. This is where I feel called. And if somebody else leaves this church and does not feel called back, they're 100% legitimate. If somebody wants to critique what I'm doing as, <clears throat> as maybe uh, caving, uh, not standing up for what I think is right, I think I can do a lot more good as a member of the church than I did at home uh, as a not member. I did a lot more fishing and I watched a lot more Netflix when I was outside of the church and I could tell you about Game of Thrones and every other popular series that was going on. But now I can, I just love the stupid little things. They're not stupid. The, the insignificant little things, uh, that the church asks us to do every week. 
And let me let me pause yeah. you, okay? Because I I think I really want to explore the practical part. Yeah. But I just I, I'm going to go through like seven quick things. Go Maybe ahead. let's spend 15 seconds on each one or less. Mm -hmm. Let me give you four possible options. Believe it. Don't believe it. It's not important to me. Or no comment. Are you comfortable with like those four options? I'll probably elaborate more than that, but go ahead. All right. So like anthropomorphic God. <coughs> I, we don't have time. We, just because of time, we don't have time to like go into each one. But How like, are we on time? It is. It's 542 right now. So so we have about 40 minutes? 45. No, we've, I think we've got about 30 minutes. Okay. 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. We'll go through these quickly. Anthropomorphic God. So believe it, not believe it. It's not important to me or no comment. I believe that the way we perceive God in this church is as a father in heaven, a son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. I believe that God can manifest himself, itself, themself in other ways to other people in ways they understand. Um, that's, that wouldn't be something we talk about or teach at church but I don't have a problem with visualizing God in the way we do it in our church. So and a mother. God is an exalted human. A mother. Um, I, I don't feel concerned if I die and it's not a bunch of humans, but that was just a way that we could understand things to try to picture a better future. Um, I, I'm fine with that. Okay. And then literal resurrected Jesus... Son of God. I'm fine with that being metaphorical. Okay. And uh, and so you already said about the Book of Mormon. What about like uh, Joseph Smith as like God's prophet on the earth, like next to Jesus and, you know, <coughs> saving, um, saving mankind and all that? Uh, the, w the thing I compare it to is my brother, the, Scott. He died at age 31. Um, within a day of his death he started becoming a myth. Not in the sense of the word that he's fake or he's um, less real or whatever. In the sense that we felt reverence and honor toward him. And he had bipolar disorder. He had a really hard life there are some memories that are really hard with him. He was a hard kid to raise for my parents, but all we remember about him is what we love. And we put him on a pedestal. I think of, I, when I wasn't a member of the church, I prayed to him because it made a lot of sense. And I, it, it was sacred to me. Um, so back to Joseph Smith. Do I believe, how do I see Joseph Smith? He's the prophet of the restoration. We honor him. He's this person of mythical proportion. <laughs> uh, we have a history in our church of trying to only give faith promo promoting history. I believe in, in, I believe a lot of our understanding about Joseph Smith is our attempt to honor him. And I believe there's a lot more to him than that. Um, he's very complicated. Um, I think the way I see him probably by a traditional member would be seen as more like a, a myth than a reality. But then I would question whether how much of the reality they know about him. And uh, it, this is a messy one. How about one true church? I don't. I think God is focused on seven billion living people, and I think this is one way to get to Him. Uh, what do you think about atheists and agnostics and people that awesome are totally people. unreligious? Atheists, some of the best <coughs> um, humanists. A lot of times, religious people. I include myself in that group now. We look at uh, atheists and we say, oh, they just believe in science or whatever. And um, Is that a line from Nacho Libre? I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but humanists, they're thinking about 
the poor and the suffering, a lot of issues, they're not thinking about God figuring it all out and making it all good after this life. And I love that impulse. If there's people who don't want to focus on things that they see as imaginary or unknowable, but they're still good, an atheist or an agnostic can be every bit as, can be way better than me and every bit as good as any Mormon. And then what about the need for like a Mormon baptism and a Mormon endowment ceremony and a Mormon marriage to make the highest degree of heaven? The whole need in Mormonism for Mormon ordinances and the need in Mormonism for like the goal of Mormonism of exaltation that's very exclusive to only if you are in the right church with the right ordinances and obey the right commandments. We... <clears throat> Growing up, we talked about this life is the time to meet God. And as a missionary and in, through seminary, I understood this as this mortal life from the time you're, birth, you're born to the time you die. And now we recognize that 99% of all humans ever, probably 99.99% um, won't have... If this is the one truth, uh, our catch-all answer to that is temple work for the dead. But it doesn't answer what their life meant. <laughs> and I talked to my dad about this, and his feeling is that the probation period is kind of from when you're born until the final judgment. And so it extends into this spirit world concept. Um, in April, I'll complete one year. And instead of, um, they won't give me the priesthood again, and then I won't go and do an endowment again. There's a one ordinance called the Restoration of Blessings. And it restores everything you had before. So I would have the... And I... That happens a year after you're baptized? Yeah, if you're worthy one year after, and if... And if a Mormon stories interview doesn't disqualify you, <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that kind of jokingly, but I think anybody who knows me, any of my leaders who would be in the position to decide whether I'm worthy for that, I hope they understand. I really look forward to that and I want to do it. I see the temple much differently than I used to see it. Um, I feel like I understand a lot of things now that I couldn't have understood before because it was kind of taboo and it was bad to go learn about it. <laughs> and um, I want to be a full participant with my people. And that's what I see those as, as symbols of being fully engaged with your group of people through your rituals and so that's a long way of saying, um, you know, the traditional LDS view would be that eventually to get to the highest glory of heaven, everybody has to go through those. <clears throat> that would be something I choose to just not feel concerned about. I, I, I told you I'm going to give you long answers for short questions. So um, if somebody were to say... You know, I'm listening to some, I'm, I'm reading some of the listener comments. Somebody wrote, I'm out. I can't handle the mental gymnastics. What, yeah. If somebody's saying you're, you're just like doing mental gymnastics, this isn't Mormonism. What, yeah. what you're doing isn't Mormonism. It, it's, it's progressive or liberal nuanced Mormonism. But, you know, if Down H. Oaks were to supervise your baptism and he knew that you really had this view, he'd say, no, 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 you can't get baptized. This is, you've got this mamby-pamby, whitewashed, sort of like <laughs> feeble, nuanced view, and you're not really a Mormon. So if somebody wanted to project that onto you, how, and I know you wouldn't want to argue with them because that's not your way, no. but like, what are your thoughts in response to somebody saying, whatever you're doing isn't Mormonism? Uh, uh, my friend Jeff that you know that we went to lunch with before this and my brother Steve, when they learned that I was doing this, rejoining the church, we got together a couple of times and 
basically they were kind of asking me all these questions. And if you take God out of it, then I am an idiot <laughs> for this. But you put God into it, and I don't, I don't care <laughs> because that, uh, what I feel is true. I don't have to write a book and prove it to you. And I know I can't, but, um, you said a lot of things in your question, but I'm trying to, this concept of I'm a mental gymnastics Mormon. Before the months before I stopped going to church, that was mental gymnastics. That was painful. Church felt hostile. And I felt totally out of place. And it hurt to go to church. And uh, right now, despite, you know, people want to say, what is Mormon? And they want to give this hardline thing. If you're not this, you're not a Mormon. Okay, compare me with somebody in 1850. <laughs> and they would say, <laughs> my bishop's not a Mormon today compared to what they were in 1850. In 1850, a good Mormon was uh, eternal marriage was polygamy and uh, garments were to your ankles. And I would say Mormonism changes every generation. And because of the internet, Mormonism is changing this generation. And there's a lot of conversations about what Mormonism is and that it's this solid, firm thing that can't change. And I would suggest that it changes every generation, just like trying to watch the hour hand on a clock. It's slow. And they aren't going to get up and do a speech where they say, hey, everybody, we were wrong this generation. Here are the changes for us to get up to date. <laughs> That's never going to happen. And you can call it pride or whatever you want, but it's not going to happen. And at a local level, that's not what we think about. I think the Mormonism of the next generation, um, what are millennials going to look like when they're 45 years old? Um, every generation does this. Every generation looks to the past and says, you're doing it wrong. Your music's bad. You're all leading us in a bad direction. Where's our country and our church going? And I would say, I want to make, I want to help make my ward a place where charity, love is greatest of all. First Corinthians 13 says, all these other things, including prophecy, will pass away. We see through a glass darkly, but charity faileth not, or whatever, charity never faileth. Um, I believe, I don't think I'm a <clears throat> prophet, and I don't, um, our generation grew up as a church that was very focused on, I know these things are true, the things you're asking me about. And, you know, the Book of Mormon is the keystone and this and that. I, I would like to think, I hope we're moving to a place where the church is first about, I love you for exactly who you are. And you may not agree with me, I may stand up and say, I know such and such is true, and you may not be able to say that, but we can be fellow saints, and we can strive to be better together. And let's stop having all these CES. The CES letter, it's been an important document. Um, there are people in my parents' generation who said, oh, they knew all that stuff in the 60s. Big whoopee. But our generation didn't know about it. It was shocking to us. And in the end, the things that you loved about Mormonism and that I loved about Mormonism growing up is we were in a community of people who loved each other. And in the end, 
that's where I'm trying to be. And I reject the notion that I have to fit some kind of harsh mold of what of things that may have been true in many cases. I'm not trying to say that hasn't been real, but people change and a church is made of people. That's my answer. There are, you know, it seems like your answer for any question is God told me to do this. And this is how Jeff characterized it to me when he was telling me about you. How do you argue with someone who says God told me to do this? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's kind of. And that's kind of what you're saying. <laughs> But I'll ask this question. No, that's not what you're saying? It, it, it is what I'm saying. Okay, um, okay. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, I, I'm guessing that's going to be your answer to this next question. But for some people, maybe for me, there, there are two things that are like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I could ever overcome those mm-hmm. short of God telling me to do this, which he's never done. I've gotten lots of great feelings. Like I love it. I miss it in many ways. But God's never talked to me in the church or out of the church in any way that I, I hesitated could ever... a minute ago because I don't want to engage in that way. Like I dismiss this discussion because God told me to do it, and I'm above this discussion. I want to engage in discussions. Oh yeah, no, no, like no. This. You made that clear. Yeah, you said at the very beginning we need to have answers. We need to talk about this stuff. Yeah, the two things that I just don't know how, I, short of God literally coming to me, I don't know how I could overcome. Um. When you read about Joseph's practice of polygamy and the young girls and the polyandry and lying to Emma and all that, and and listeners, please either cover your ears if you're believers or if you're really sensitive. For someone who really studies what Joseph Smith did, you it's it's not hard to get to the point of view that he was kind of a sexual predator, like you know that that like. His love, you know, like it's it's it seems complete heresy and blasphemy to ever say Joseph Smith and sexual predator kind of in the same sentence in the Mormon context. But yet, if you really just if if you take any other person who you don't believe is a prophet of God and put him in the place of what you know Joseph Smith did, you want to kill this guy. You want to stick him in jail. You want to brand him as a, on a on a list somewhere where he can never ever be around children or or women again, you want to castrate them like some wanted to do because of his behavior, right? So that's a really hard thing to get over. Because mm-hmm. it's not just like some nice guy that started a church and he thought it was true. It's like that behavior can be is, is really serious for people, some people who study it. And then the other thing is just, if the Book of Mormon <coughs> isn't true, you know, then, then some people go, well, then it had to have been made up which means it was a fraud, which means that it was like created with the deception in mind. If it's not true, it's either true. Like, it's like Gordon B. Hinckley likes to reduce it or like to reduce it. It's either everything it claims to be or the biggest fraud ever perpetrated. Yeah. I mean, I can see Gordon B. Hinckley's point of view there. If you don't think it's historical, mm-hmm. many people are just going to be like, it's a, the Book of Mormon is a total fraud, which means the first vision is probably a fraud, which means Joseph was just totally scamming people to make money or to get women or get power. And so those two things for, for many people, it's like, yeah, I can love the church. I can see there's good in it. I can, you know, igno- you know, whatever, but like, I can't rejoin because of those two things. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I probably already answered it unless God tells you to, right? But I mean... Do those two things, do you just like have to just say, I don't know, or do you not read the history the way I do? I don't like the answer that is often given of, we just don't know. It implies that from a faithful perspective, Joseph did nothing wrong almost, (laughs) or nothing significant wrong. I was named after Joseph. I just thought of that as I said that out loud. Um... And then there's the other answer of he was one of the worst people ever type of what you've just described. Um, One of the things I wrote when I was describing this is just, uh, yeah, I guess it is going to come back to this. It it sounds reductive. It sounds stupid. Um, Because the feeling I had was go back to this church not because there aren't problems, 
in, go back in spite of them. And um, this is going to sound unsatisfactory, I know. But tell me, uh, did you get into seminary? When did you have your spiritual awakening? How yeah. old? Yeah, so 16. Like, 17. were you reading the Book of Mormon yeah. in high school? Yep. Were yep. you underlining your yep. scriptures yep. and taking a little I was scripture journal? Just like you. Yeah. And have, okay. I was attending all the sessions of general conference. I was praying so you, every night and every morning and all that. Yeah. I know <clears throat> people would will feel frustration or anger at just saying, um, you know, look at the fruits, because you had experiences and I did. Um, and within the church, we interpreted that to mean um, because I felt this uplifting feeling with this scripture and enlightenment, it means this whole book is true and it also means this prophet is everything we claim. And then our scriptures also say he's second to Jesus and uh, or done more for the salvation, save Jesus. Um, it's really, uh, you're valid if you think that's hard and if you think I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. But it's also something, that's where I was describing earlier where there is Joseph Smith, the historical person, and there is Joseph Smith, our mythology, which is the greatest parts of what he contributed. And then you could get into an argument of if somebody does something bad, can they also do something good? And let's just ask that about myself. <laughs> can, okay, but, can I think or do horrible things? And, thi and, yeah. and that argument is, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a unsatisfying. common one I've heard. No, no, no. It's a common yeah. one I've heard, which is like prophets are fallible. You know, Noah got drunk and Peter denied Christ. And yeah, you know, uh, Abraham had, he was a polygamist and, and he had harems. Right. So, uh, so like, except God gave him those, supposedly. But yeah. But there's like, oh, he swears, or sometimes he gets grouchy, or you know, he forgot something. But or he told doesn't a fib, go told tell a, fib. a girl to marry him. To, or a, to me, those are like a whole different yeah. category. Well, to some people, and I'm not trying to. Yeah. I'm actually not trying to pressure you or even put you on the hot spot. This is just a conversation. But like yeah. for some, it's like. Yeah, there's normal mistakes, but like if you think about people that did really awful things, really mm -hmm. awful things, like Warren Jeffs. Yeah. Like some people would read the history and say Joseph Smith is more like Warren Jeffs or L. Ron Hubbard than he is you or me. Yeah. Like to put us, oh, we're flawed, so he's flawed. Yeah. No, 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 no. We didn't we didn't in in some readings forge a book and pressure 15 year olds to have sex with him and, yeah. and threaten the parents and his wife with eternal damnation. If you know what I mean? Like that's heavy, intense stuff. Yeah. And so I'm again, if, if the answer is just God told me. And so, yeah, it's hard for me to, you know, when you're say a missionary and you have the, what's that? Joseph Smith set of tapes. Every missionary was passing Truman around Madsen. Truman Madsen's yeah. tapes. And, um, And again, you've made him, uh, you've just learned to have so much respect and admiration, and then you learn some difficult things in the history, some very difficult things. Um, my stance is that things that came from Joseph Smith, I think God can use to inspire me. I don't feel inclined to sit here and say everything you just described must be wrong or untrue um, because I think I, I don't I don't think that's the case. <laughs> um, I think there's been a lot of deception and uh, uh, there's Joseph the myth that we hold up here. And there's Joseph the Messy that we keep digging up more each year. And or, I don't know. Um, I want to honor our tradition. <coughs> Brigham Young was, 
was a, also messy. A, a messy character too. My wife's a descendant of Brigham Young, and uh, I'm not inclined to sit here and uh, you know stand on a wall like Samuel the Lamanite and say you're wrong, John Delenn. I'm just inclined to say that. Joseph Smith started this thing, and it brings a lot of good to a lot of our lives. And by respecting the tradition of Joseph Smith doesn't mean I have to embrace or, or excuse any of these things you're talking about. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you for... Some people are saying I'm making them uncomfortable, so I'll stop now. I'll stop yeah. making you uncomfortable. <laughs> um, it is also sounds like you're you're not saying... Yours is the path. It doesn't. It sounds like you're not calling post Mormons to come back to church necessarily. No, true. That's true. You don't think that's everyone's path? Not everyone's path. I think there are. I think there's a segment of post Mormons like me who, at some point, um, when you the idea of divorcing <laughs> from the church is very painful. And for most people, they just want to leave it in their rearview mirror forever, which is how I felt. Um, but for some people, uh, I don't know how or why you would do it. I can't guarantee. I can't say you'll, you know, go kneel down and read Moroni's promise and suddenly you'll have an experience like mine. I have no clue. I prayed for years with no answer. Um I don't pretend to know everything that's behind this, but I know these groups we talk about and that I tried to form where you're meeting with people across town and you're meeting with people once a month um, <clears throat> in your car on the way back. I suggested that you were talking about these Thrive groups that were starting to form. And I said, why don't we make every ward in Utah, how many <laughs> words are there? A thousand words or 10,000 words? Why can't every ward be a thrive group? Why can't every ward be a place where whether you can respect Joseph Smith or not, whether you want to be a member or not, you pr if you live here, you probably live in a neighborhood with a lot of Mormons and Latter-day Saints. Um, <clears throat> why can't we have ways to come together. It, it's been hard. When I was out of the church, yeah, people didn't come to my house and I didn't go to theirs either because it was awkward. I didn't understand how to do it. You know, if I, if I took a step forward toward them, would they just perceive it as me wanting to come back to the church and jump all over me with their love bomb for two weeks until they realized I didn't want that. I just wanted to be friends in the neighborhood. Um, I, I would like to see our wards get better at loving each other, our neighborhoods that our wards happen to coincide with. I would like to see with Mormons, ex-Mormons, non-Mormons, I hate this dynamic of you can look down the street and all the Mormon houses that are active, you know those people, and all the houses that aren't Mormon, if they aren't right next to you, you don't know those people. Or you stay away from them because you're afraid or they're um, not part of the community. Or you just don't have any common ground. You have no reason to cross paths. What are you going to go? Go knock on their door and say, hi, I want to meet you. I care about you. You sound like a salesman. Right. Um, whereas if neighborhoods, and I think my church could take a lead role in this because we do have a strong presence in neighborhoods all over Utah. And it doesn't have to be about baptizing everybody or reactivating everybody. It could be about saying, hey, it's Sandy Fall cleanup or Sandy Spring cleanup. And we have a few older people in our neighborhood who can't do this. Let's all get together and do it. Um, here's old ladies. They need their walk shoveled. I live in an older neighborhood. We have lots of excuses we could make to get together and do uplifting things. And we don't have to, that doesn't have to be a basis for I'm trying to convert you or I just want to be your friend because it might help me bring you to church. But for those people who <laughs> come close to those in a ward 
and start to feel like church could be a safe place, sure, I wish that for them because the church can be an awesome community for people that's way stronger. It's your own neighborhood in Utah. It's three blocks around you. And that is hard to beat if you can find a way to do it. I'm saying this with a lot of passion and I know a lot of you can't do it and you're rolling your eyes or maybe you're flipping me off from your screen or something. If it's not for you, you know, if it's not your neighbor's, let's find ways that you can go to your parents' house for dinner and not feel mad because they want to talk about what they were doing for their church calling that week and it makes you feel like crap and you can't talk about what you care about. <laughs> let's find ways to get together and stop thinking of the world in Mormon and non-Mormon or... Uh, I'm on a tangent, aren't have I? You been, have you been able to do that with... <laughs> so I imagine some of your ex-Mormon friends have like abandoned you or shunned you or been mad at you or or given you grief or at least heckled you or grilled you. Have you experimented with with maintaining those relationships? Oh, I really want to. Have you been doing it? Yeah, and I don't get... If somebody's mad at me, like when I got baptized... Have you lost ex-Mormon friends? Going back to church. Not that I know of. Okay, good. And and have you maintained or strengthened relationships with ex-Mormon friends once you've come back? Yeah, it's that's why I went, you know, my brother's the first one. and Steve. Yeah. And I wanted to go to Thrive with him on a Sunday, even though some members of my church might see that as this problematic thing. Um we need more places where instead of talking about each other and who's right and who's wrong and who's stupid, we need places where we sit together and eat food and do something fun um, because there's common ground. We share, we're like two overlapping circles, a little Venn diagram, and we're like 80% overlapped. But that first two years, especially after leaving the church, people feel like they're in two different universes with people they've loved for years and we can do, <laughs> um, the pain is lost relationships more than anything. And, um, for me, I, if I feel called to anything, <laughs> it's, I love this people who, this group, people who are listening to your podcasts because I know the kinds of experiences they've, many of them have had. I feel an affinity for them. I know they're good people. I want to, you know, you don't have time to be close friends with a ton of people, but if I can be a voice to say, let's change the way we think, you know, if your kid leaves the church, uh, find reasons to get together. My parents were brilliant at it. Um, you know, just all the time they would invite the family up to the home, even though it was awkward. Just having those touch points is so important to get through that hard stage of thinking each other is, are idiots or uh, whatever the term is and rediscovering your love for each other and rediscovering that you do have a lot of common ground, even if you don't share the same church. I want to, I, we're going to have to wrap up because we're about to host uh, our first Thrive event, our first local Thrive group meeting in holiday. I want to ask you just a couple quick questions. Um, is, uh, is it frustrating that, that you may have this vision for the church, but the brethren don't share that vision? That I'm not Oaks concerned and, at that level. Oaks and Nelson and Bednar, all those guys, say, say it now. You're what? I'm not concerned at that level. There, that's the church. That's I'm worried about my little neighborhood. And uh, so your ward, you're basically living at the ward level. Yeah. And believing or 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 working at the ward level. The level that matters is the level of the people you interact with on a regular basis, and you know, and you come to love. Uh, everything above that is way out of my control, and I have no pretension to trying to influence it. Tom Kimball, who's one of the first people I ever interviewed on Mormon Stories with Dan Witherspoon on the Fowler Stages of Faith episode, he used to say the church is true from the bishop down, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it that way. <laughs> the church um, is true from the ward down. Basically. I just think at the top level, they're no, I'm having... Not, I'm not trying to put yeah. that in your mouth. Yeah, that 
but he used to make that joke. Yeah. But basically, you're just saying you're you're you're. It's basically the Stephen Covey sphere of influence and sphere of concern. And Covey makes the point that we're healthiest and happiest when we limit our sphere of concern to our sphere of influence. Yeah. If our sphere of concern is way bigger than our sphere of influence, <coughs> we're just frustrated all the time. You can spend a lot of emotion disagreeing with the church or with the Being angry president at what Oak said at or, general conference or whatever. Yeah, or Trump or whoever. Yeah. Or you can zero in and say, what can I influence? You know, if I'm upset politically, how can I get involved in politics? If I'm upset religiously, how can I get involved? If I don't think my ward is, uh, does something well, there's a difference between wanting to be a positive contributor in a loving way versus approaching it like you're an activist who thinks you know, know better than everybody. Because when you're in that mindset, you're not together with people. And a ward, when it's functioning well, is about people who love and respect each other. And that's the level I think um, I can only influence that level, um, and that's where I'm, my thoughts are. So I want to I want to bring you back for an hour just to talk about your lived experience at church now and how you're navigating that. Because I think that if, if we had more time, we would go into that. Just like how you deal with elders quorum, how you deal with Sunday school, how you deal with <laughs> how you deal with sacrament meeting, how you know. Yeah. And so I want to talk about all that. Uh, but we, we won't talk about that today. We'll 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 do one more hour with you uh, as soon as you can come back. Shout out to the patient, Crescent Fourteenth <laughs> uh, Ward. I love you and thank you for. <laughs> I love you and thank you for welcoming me in as uh, kind of an oddball. Um, I love you. That's the spirit that I want conveyed. I don't want somebody to listen to this podcast and see me trying to be a, uh, a know-it-all. The, sp the spirit of the summary of what you want to talk about later is what I just said. I appreciate that. That's beautiful. And, uh, there's a part of me that longs for the the good feelings you're feeling right now that, that longs to reunite. So I, I get that. And I, I see it as sacred. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. And yeah. Anyone who's gonna disrespect you, I'm gonna I'm gonna disrespect because um <laughs> I think you you're approaching this with love and kindness and and integrity and I'm not gonna respect anyone who can't respect that. <laughs> or at least I'll feel sorry for them and sad that they that they don't show you respect and give you respect because well you deal with people along a whole spectrum <clears throat> when i was donating to you it was when i was hurting the most is when i was i didn't give you a ton of money but um that's a hard dynamic because you've made this your full-time job and you have to live in that world across the spectrum and so somebody could point out you trying to um, empathize or show support for somebody who's in a really angry place, and they could point to that as you being the anti-Mormon, the anti-Christ, the whatever. Um, I, I see that differently. And I don't know why I said that. I, did, I feel I Thank need you. to say that. So the last question I'll ask you uh, before we end, and then we'll have one more hour later. Okay. What have been the spiritual or the fruits, spiritual fruits or just the positive fruits of coming back to church for you? How is it, what fruits have grown and blossomed from that decision in your life? Camaraderie. Just uh, um, having a group of people that is your people that you go to each Sunday and you you have an excuse to get together, to shake hands, to hug. Um, there's a lady whose husband died <clears throat> this last year. And sometimes we're both sitting there alone. Because a lot of times I, you know, sometimes some of my family's with me and sometimes not. And, and she'll just kind of grab my arm and say, uh, you know, seeing you here makes it easier for me to be here. Or something like that. And just that connection. <laughs> Where do you fit that in on a bullet point in a CES letter? <laughs> How much does that weigh? For me, it weighs a lot. 
and uh, I love those connections, and I love um, the chance to try to tap into spirituality. When I left the church, I really distrusted anything spiritual, and it felt like it was all about generating emotions. But uh, to sing a song at church and to find yourself singing, and, and then suddenly you can't sing because your voice is breaking because your emotions um, are kind of overflowing. And you just feel love for everybody around you and you feel love for your family and you're thinking, how can I be a better dad? How can I be a better husband? How can I be a better neighbor? Um, not as a burden of things you have to do, as something you want to do. And that spirituality, that way of connecting people is, uh, I absolutely love it. And, and I didn't know how much I missed it. I hope if people, as I describe that, if you're missing it, Find a way to, to bring that into your life, whether it's at this church or somewhere else. Beautiful. So at the end of the day, it's community. Is that a big part of it? Yeah, but that word gets thrown around a lot like, um, oh yeah, the church is just a bunch of junk and then community is what they're really good at. It's just slapping a few people together and and you have community. And like community can just be um, the community. That's huge. The fact that the church can make huge. that community yeah, it's huge. is special. And so to list that as just one thing the church does well, like it's just a minor thing, like it's a central thing yeah. because that, for a lot of people, they're sent, when they say, uh, God, I love God, or God loves me, <laughs> in their mind, they're thinking of that person they love and the person that loved them. Um, or like last night when I, I asked my dad <clears throat> uh, to give me a blessing, and I hadn't had a blessing in a decade or so. And I've always been struck by how in, in the church we say prayers a lot of times. It's like we talk to people in third person by talking through God to them. Instead of telling you I love you directly, I say, I want, I want you to know God loves you uh, as some kind of blessing or prayer. Um, but it's, it's a tradition and it's, um, I think it's beautiful. But I also understand that when you feel separated from it, it can feel like hocus pocus and um, and it doesn't seem beautiful. <laughs> yeah, people recently have gotten mad at me when they hear me say that I believe the church does a lot of good and maybe in some ways more good than harm. I, I make people really angry, but um, I, I like you, like like Yuval, Yuval Harari, like anyone who's studied evolution and, and sociology and anthropology know that community is an essential part of how we've evolved as a species and we're tribal creatures and it's, it's essential that we are part of healthy tribes. That's the optimum scenario for us to be living as humans. Yeah. And, and so, and as, as one who's tried now for 15 more plus years to create secular community, um, and to see these secular communities rise and fall and rise and fall and, you know, promise and then they peter. And there's no way to really get people to dedicate the time or the money or the effort to really build something vibrant. And we're not giving up, by the way, but to see how hard it is to build a vibrant, meaningful community where people deliver casseroles and help each other move and show up when they have cancer and and help raise each other's kids and really are there for each other <clears throat> is as superficial or shallow as you may think Mormon relationships are. We show up, Mormons show up. I shouldn't say we, I guess I could say we, but Mormons <laughs> show up, Mormons stack the chairs, Mormons deliver the casseroles, Mormons paid, they contribute time and money, you know, time and money to, to build the community. They just do. So yeah. I completely uh, agree with how non-trivial uh, 
the community aspects is. And my guess is if I dug deeper, there are spiritual elements in addition to the community elements. I think any community that's close has spiritual elements, which is whether it's in a religious higher. setting or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's people connecting with something bigger. Well, Joe, I gotta I gotta run home because Margie's got a French bread pizza waiting for me, and I gotta get back here by seven so that we can have our first thrive community meeting for holidays. So cool. You are a beautiful, lovely uh, human. Jeff and Chelsea, kudos to you for having me interview Joe. Um, Joe, you're awesome. I've loved having you. I hope we can uh, build on a friendship and. And I hope you'll come back because we want to talk to you about how you are able to do church. <laughs> I'm really Absolutely. curious to spend an hour about how you keep from killing yourself or pulling <laughs> your hair out or going crazy in a Mormon church in 2020. We do in the it? Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. <laughs> yeah, sure. And all the changes Russell and Nelson's making and yeah. all that. It'd be fun to talk about. So we'll have you back. Cool. Any final thing you want to say to? progressive and post-Mormons out there listening? You're good. You're valid. Whatever you're, wherever you're at. Um, there's a good way forward. Give it time. Wherever you end up, you don't have to end up where I end up. You can be in a good place. And to the church? Anything you want to say to the church? <laughs> I guess it's not our job to counsel the brethren, huh? Uh, I can say... To or to church. members, or to members. To the church, I love you. With your faults, with whatever, um, I'm glad you're part of my life. Church, whatever that means. <laughs> and to believing members, anything you want to say to them? Yeah, I love. I think I said that with what what I said to my ward. Um, a lot of the best friends I have from over the years, the church is what brought us together. Um. Missions, wards, serving and callings together. And when you leave, you uh, you can feel like all those relationships were pretty shallow. That's the fear in your head. But think about it for a while, and you know they weren't. <laughs> you know you loved those people, and they loved you. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think just... Uh, There's lots of ways to good, and when people act in goodwill, good things can happen. And maybe maybe there can be overlaps between people who right now don't feel like they want any of the church in their lives. Maybe there's a, a role, at least here in Utah, where the church is so predominant in our neighborhoods. Uh, who knows? Maybe there's a role that it could play where where people get more plugged into their neighborhoods and they aren't thinking about, do I need to drive across town to the UU church or whatever? Not to diss any other church if that meets your needs. Um, but there's magic in, in having your community be right outside your front door. But it sounds like you're, you're basically putting out a call to believing Mormons to reach out to those who leave or to, uh, who have never been members or, or even who apostatize and love them and find a way to include them. Yeah, love them. Um, but have them be a part of your lives. Because love is like, oh, I love them. I feel love for them. Yeah, don't but be a Mormon them... that's so busy being a Mormon that you don't have time to be a friend. To people. To one of these people that won't. Who have left. That won't help achieve a goal. Yeah. <laughs> have time for that person who will never come back. And that is love. Amen. We're ending on that. Huge thanks to Tyler Alden for being here in studio, helping out. Thanks to Cody for helping us uh, at the beginning. Huge thanks to the Open Stories Foundation board and to donors that make all this possible. If you love this type of programming, please support us. Go to mormonstories.org and donate um, 10, 15, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford, 10 bucks a month. Uh, we need your support to make this happen. Thanks for everyone who joined us on Facebook Live. Thanks for your comments. Um, if you want to appear on Mormon Stories or know some good ideas, please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. We love your feedback. And um, and uh, we'll have you back, Joe. So thank right. you. Thanks. Thanks to everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories. Happy 2020. It's going to be a great year. Take care, everybody. <laughs>